the Privacy and Autonomy panel. Professor Rodwin has a very quick follow-up to his presentation. Someone asked me for uh, further support for my argument, and I did have two articles, a 1,200-word JAMA article and a larger law review article. If anyone is interested, I'd be glad to zap you a copy and just email me at m. R O D W I N M Rodwin at gmail dot com, and there will be no exam, no required re you know reading and testing. But okay, so we are going to launch into our panel, and it is going to be moderated by my esteemed colleague Jessica Berg. present their work to you and hold our questions until the end and then we'll get them back up here and you can discuss uh, some of these issues with them. Our first speaker is going to be Nick Terry. He's the Hall Render Professor of Law at the Indiana University Robert H. McKinley School of Law, where he serves as co-director of the Hall Center for Law and Health. His research interests lie primarily at the intersection of medicine law and information technology. He's published widely in this area. He's going to talk to us today on Big Data's Existential Challenge to Patient Privacy and health privacy exceptionalism. Thank you. And uh, Max and uh, Jess and uh, Sharona, thank you very much for the invitation. So the, uh, the topic of this, a, clearly a, a headline uh, torn from the pages of the New York Daily Post, except where there's too many syllables. Um, two sort of claims or things I'd like to explore with you this afternoon. Uh, first of all, what does privacy mean, health privacy mean, in a world of big data? And secondly, sort of more conceptually, uh, after uh, uh, a move to big data, is the US approach to health data, which is essentially a sector-based approach to privacy, and therefore we sometimes refer to as health privacy exceptionalism, in that it has its own uh, specific regulatory model. Is that going to survive after a move to big data? So of course, if I'm going to explain big data, I have to explain small data, um, talk a little bit about uh, big data, and then the three sort of major bullets I'm going to try and explore, although I'll probably get through one of them before uh, uh, Jess uh, gets the big hook out, um, is, uh, are the, are the non or the, the, the regulatory challenges that we face going forward with uh, health privacy sort of migrating or health data migrating to big data? Um, and looking at sort of whether breach notification has got any, or breach notification regulatory models have got any play here. Uh, what happens uh, with regard to uh, what I'm going to describe as medically inflected data, non PHI data? Um, and then really, frankly, the sort of the, the final bullet is, is the total inadequacy of um, uh, our current data model, our data privacy, confidentiality, security, breach notification model uh, when faced with um, big data type threats. So patient privacy and small data. Um, so the subject of this conference, uh, I will now, uh, or the, uh, will now summarize in three slides. Um, this is the HIPAA model, right? Um, and HIPAA is very easy to understand. The details are tricky. Uh, basically, we have a red zone and a green zone, right? And the data is allowed to uh, uh, play in the green zone, um, but it's not allowed to go into the red zone. Um, and there are two walls we build around the green zone uh, to try and make that happen. Uh, first, we build a confidentiality wall because HIPAA's got nothing to do with privacy. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we build a confidentiality wall, and the idea of that is we stop people in the green zone exporting data to the red zone. And then we have a security rule, or wall, which basically stops people in the red zone hacking into the green zone and grabbing data. Um, we then, because we like to complicate our models, um, we then put sort of five faucets uh, on the edge of the green zone that we can sort of turn on, uh, which allows data to drip out 
from the green zone into the red zone. So uh, from the top, uh, the justice system, the legal system, there's some drip, drip, drip. There we have public health, which takes a whole lot. Um, you can consent to anything, <laughs> um, and people do. Um, and the two that we've spent a lot of time on during high tech and the omnibus rule and so forth have been tightening up the marketing uh, faucet and the data sale faucet, which uh, are represented there, and I won't bore you with the omnibus rule, even though I've read it. Um, and most of the conversations we've had about small data have been about how big should the green zone be? Whether we should make it smaller, such as, for example, it only applies to the care team or the medical domain, um, and the sort of problems we have with all of the consents and sort of um, function creep and data leakage and so on and so forth. And so the subject of this conference is how much secondary use will you tolerate with regard to your data or as a matter of public policy uh, generally, and it's where you want to draw that line uh, that Barbara talked a lot about and so on. Um, so that's little data. That's uh, little data in our current privacy model. And so what's big data? Um, well, big data looks more like this. Um, it's business intelligence, it's analytics and visualization, it's operational infrastructure, it's analytics, it's predictive analytics in particular. Uh, it's very complex. Um, for our purposes, a few bullets. Big data is something that describes actually two things. One, the actual data itself, and secondly, the analytic engines that are uh, behind it and are doing interesting things with it. A predictive analytics being the most obvious. Um, next bullet, I think, is from Paul Ohm, um, uh, Colorado now uh, on, on comment to FTC, um, has talked about the fallacy of anonymization and de-identification. Uh, the argument is made that uh, big data is so big that essentially it negates anonymization and de-identification. The final bullet is sort of the concept of big data. If you go out and collect data, you usually know what you're going to use it for. You usually have some structure in mind as you go out and start collecting the data. Big data flips that. Big data says we just collect everything because we've got the storage now to do that. And we'll figure out what to do with it later. And our predictive analytic and other engines are so powerful, we don't really need those structures. We can add things later. And so that's sort of what big data looks like. Um, it's massive. Everyone's publishing stuff about it. Uh, it's the future of everything. It's the future of healthcare. It's going to save the world as we know it and beat North Korea. I don't know. It, it's everything uh, uh, all in one package. For our purposes, it's important, I think, to, to look at what the data pools are, the, the healthcare data pools that can flow into big data. So uh, activity claims and cost data, uh, clinical data, uh, pharmaceutical R&D data. Now, those are the ones you would expect me to talk about at a conference like this. Um, but I'm not going to, uh, primarily because pharmaceutical companies aren't exactly crazy about letting loose this data, so it's going to stay proprietary and probably hidden away for a few more decades. Same probably, at least for intelligent healthcare entities with regard to claims and cost data. So what about clinical data? We have these electronic medical records. You, you put a lightning connector, sorry, it's a Mac thing, in the back of your electronic medical record, and all of this stuff spills out into big data. No, that's not going to happen because electronic medical records at the moment are crap. Uh, they are awful. Uh, they're almost unusable. Uh, the biggest, the, the number one uh, growing profession in the United States is, is for scribes. Uh, who can operate EMRs for physicians. Um, yes, it will happen that all of that data will be sucked out, but I'm not particularly worried it, about it today. More interesting is patient behavior and sentiment data. This is data that comes from social media. It is exhaust data, as they term it, from uh, transactions. Um, the Internet of Things everything in our homes, about our persons that has an IP address, uh, data is being collected from that. So obvious examples, 
Um, you join a, or you like a page uh, involving um, uh, MS Care on Facebook. That's a data point. You go to the supermarket and you buy an over-the-counter uh, pregnancy testing uh, kit and you use your affinity card at the supermarket when you buy it. Um, you go to Amazon and you buy a book called uh, Living with Breast Cancer. All right? All of that sort of data is what I'm talking about here. So how does patient privacy and big data fit together? Well, if you ask the FTC, they'll show you that which I think is useless. So let's go back to my model. Remember where we were? We have health privacy, we have a red zone, and we have a green zone. And that's how we viewed health privacy. You might not agree with each other as to exactly how we're going to do it, green zone, red zone, etc. but we're all roughly familiar with the model. So what happens if we were to invert it? What happens if we were to say, okay, there's traditional health data space. Whoopee. We recognize that that's sort of a hipper zone. We understand that. Big data doesn't care. Basically, in a world of big data, all the big data needs to do is stay away from that little red zone. Everything else operates in a completely hipper free zone. In fact, basically a privacy free zone zone. This is an unregulated area of data, be it health data or not. And thus, not only do I think we have an existential problem for health privacy, but also we have a challenge to the very way we conceive of health privacy in this country, which is on a sector-based, exceptional basis. For big data, I think we are going to become, we hipper people are going to become somewhat irrelevant. Or at least that's something I'd like you at least to think about. So here are the regulatory challenges. We've got four things that we can regulate health data with at the moment. A privacy model, confidentiality, security, breach notification. Those are our four, those, that's what we have in the toolbox. Um, First of all, HIPAA doesn't do anything with privacy. There is nothing in HIPAA that in any way impedes the collection of data, which is what privacy is about. The only thing HIPAA does is confidentiality. In other words, it's a disclosure-centric disclosure model of data protection. It doesn't stop the collection of data. It merely impedes, sometimes, the disclosure of health data. Security, yeah, okay, it's out there, best practices and so on. Um, it's probably how most of the people are getting uh, 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 taken down by the OCR at the moment. Um, but I don't think it's a, a major piece that I want to talk about. What about breach notification? We've heard a lot about that after high tech, and now, of course, the switch in its standard um, in the omnibus rule. Um, my point is it looks like it might be useful, but when you uh, peel back the first layer, it proves to be non-useful for a bunch of sort of micro um, exceptionalism reasons. Secondly, uh, what does all this medical or uh, medically inflective data uh, going around uh, do to health privacy? To my mind, it allows big data to essentially create a surrogate record. They don't really need to get into our HIPAA protected records anymore because the specificity by which that they will be able to analyze the medical inflected data will give them all of the marketing data they want. So that's part of the irrelevance argument. And thirdly, uh, when we're using a disclosure only regulating model such as HIPAA, uh, is that any kind of force to use against big data? And my argument is no. Um, so what about uh, data breach notification? We know everyone gets breached, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you do get breached, you have to notify people about it. If you get notified about it and it's over 500 people, you get to go on the HHS wall of shame and people, <laughs> people mock you for your bad security. And uh, more and more OCR is actually coming after people who are being shamed and whacking them with fines as well. Um, 
But if you look a bit more closely, take you take that first uh, layer of breach notification, it's not awfully optimistic. Um, first of all, um, under the uh, uh, omnibus rule, as you know, we now have this new uh, switch. We have a presumption of compromised data rule, uh, which changed from the harm rule in the interim rule, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that only applies to the exceptional cases, right? The covered entities and so on. So this narrow range slice of traditional players, it doesn't apply to most big data players. Never mind, you say. Remember that under high tech, we said that breach notification applies not just to covered entities. And the FTC got to make rules about those non-covered entities, which originally were the same as the HHS rules. And you think, great, health information generally is going to be protected by a breach notification rule that the FTC is going to be in charge of. Not exactly, because high tech was limited to personal health records and similar kinds of data. Now, that's just so 2007, right? I mean, back then, which of course is when high tech was written for 2009, because it was a previous act that was recast, um, we were worried about Google Health. Google Health doesn't even exist anymore, all right? Uh, this stuff isn't happening. Um, we're we're going to see some cycle back with mobile apps and so on, but that's all going to be personally curated stuff. It's not going to be stuff that's curated by uh, players. So the FTC rule doesn't help. So basically, breach notification isn't going to apply to big data that lets loose any health data unless they happen to fall under one of the narrow, excuse me, on one of the more broadly stated state laws. And very few of those will apply because most state breach notification statutes have a carve out for health because they say we don't need to cover health because there's that HIPAA thing. Oops. So breach notification looks like it might help, but it's not. Medical inflected data. All right. This is a recent uh, uh, piece of research done on Facebook data. And they just collected uh, Facebook data um, and were able to show, quote, a vi wide variety of personal's personal attributes ranging from sexual orientation to intelligence automatically and accurately inferred using Facebook likes. The data that they used for this was incredibly shallow, but they were able to establish immense amounts of personal uh, information uh, uh, and, and medically inflected data, uh, personal data, um, from a very shallow range of, of social media. Once you would, if you deepen that and you add in Twitter and, and, and so on, LinkedIn, it gets really big. So um, I guess my point is that on the, the exceptionalism point is something that we've always sort of suspected that our medical selves exist outside of HIPAA and HIPAA protected zones. And what big data is doing is making that very, very clear, uh, thus negating an awful lot of HIPAA high-tech sector-based protection. Um, and yet that's a big way that we do things. I mean, we have, um, we have a, a, a particular privacy model for financial things. You know, we have HIPAA, and you know, we even have a very, very narrow sector for video rentals, right? And these are sector-based privacy uh, things. Um, and I think, essentially, uh, big data mining, data collection and mining, will allow uh, 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 those who wish to market to us, uh, we've seen New York Times stories about Target, uh, Walmart, and so on, uh, will be able to do so without uh, uh, trespassing into the HIPAA-protected zone. Uh, we become irrelevant. That little red ball at the end as big data, data stamps along. So does that take us to a broader point, that here we are in Healthland uh, relying on a disclosure-based rule, um, and I think when it comes to big data, that's like taking the proverbial knife to the gunfight. You cannot fight big data or push back against big data with the disclosure rule. It's just not going to happen. Instead, you have to collect, you have to have some kind of data collection rule uh, that so many of our trading partners uh, use. 
Um, if you look at uh, both the White House proposals uh, from 2012 and also the FTC, which really sort of came through commerce uh, proposals in the same year, uh, both of them were uh, uh, trying to establish far more robust uh, privacy models, uh, particularly the White House, um, though I think the, uh, uh, the privacy by design principle that the FTC uh, uh, put front and center in its proposals is a, is, a, is a meme that we want to take and run with as we look at how we build future uh, regimes. Um, but both of those proposals had specific exceptions for health. They maintained the model of health privacy exceptionalism and did not, I mean, nothing's come out, out of these two reports, but neither of the sets of proposals would have applied to health if they had been enacted. And that's a shame because if you look at just three of those White House proposals, individual control, consumers have a right to exercise control over what personal data companies collect from them and how they use it. Respect for context. Customers have, consumers have a right to expect that companies will collect, use, and disclose personal data in ways that are consistent with the context in which consumers provide the data. And if you look at the EU data directive, that's, that's that key conceptual uh, foundation of that. And then focused collection. Consumers have a right to reasonable limits on the personal data that companies collect and retain. Proportional use post-collection. So those three principles, if enacted, I think, could really give us a true collection-centric uh, uh, regime that would push back against big data. Absent those kinds of major reforms, uh, big data will take over, uh, not just uh, uh, health data, uh, in its surrogate forms at least, uh, but most other forms of data. And we will cheer ourselves up uh, by recording as law professors like to do in boring law review articles, um, the occasional victory uh, that we see, say, in a state high court or something. So something like the Google settlement of a couple of weeks ago, um, or a rather interesting case that just came out of uh, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts on certification from a Fed district court uh, question uh, that interpreted the, Ma the Massachusetts uh, privacy rule as uh, about credit card information collection uh, as uh, not permitting stores to like collect zip codes and, and other sort of democratic information. Uh, small victories like that aside, I think it's more likely that we're going to join the world of Dilbert. Can say, consultants say that three quintillion bytes of data are created every day. It comes from everywhere. It knows all. According to the book of Wikipedia, its name is Big Data. Big Data lives in the cloud. It knows what we do. In the past, our company did many evil things, but if we accept big data on our servers, we will be saved from bankruptcy. So let us pray at big data. Is it too late to side with the devil? Shh, it hears you. Is it big data or is it the Borg? Thank you. <laughs>
by the privacy rule or they are not covered by the privacy rule, as the case may be. And I want to put this in context first so you know where we're going with this. What is primary information versus secondary information? Well, everyone would say treatment, of course, is the, the purpose, right, for health information, at least the initial purpose, and that's clearly a primary. But under the privacy rule, so too are payment and healthcare operations. And the way we attempt to give extra protection to payment and healthcare operations that we don't give to treatment is we apply something called the minimum necessary uh, requirements. So when you use that, you can only disclose as a covered entity the minimum necessary. Then we come down to the two areas of secondary uses. And I want to tell you about the uh, first one, number four. This is sometimes called the public purpose exception. And there are 12 specific categories of information in the privacy rule that covered entities can disclose without consent or authorization from the individual. And these are things such as public health disclosures, law enforcement disclosures, disclosures of suspected child abuse, et cetera. Right? I'm not going to talk about those. I want to talk about number five, which is the probably the most overlooked, in my view, of the secondary uses, the most difficult to deal with conceptually, and in some ways, uh, issues that kind of circle back to um, what Dick was talking about. And these are the secondary uses that require an individual to execute an authorization. Now, basically, as the individual whose health information we're talking about, you could authorize anybody to have them, right? And conceivably, that's what happens. So after very briefly talking about the elements of an authorization, I want to talk about two kinds of the many kinds of authorizations for the disclosure of what we could call secondary information, and that is research uses and the category of so-called compelled authorizations. So very quickly on the core elements of an authorization, you have to describe um, the information you want to disclose, say who you are, who's signing it, say who gets it, um, say um, why you're doing it, how long they can do it, and you sign it. That's basically it. There are a bunch of other things, but that's enough. Okay. Now I want to talk about the research authorization changes that went into effect March 26th of this year. The HIPAA privacy rule took effect in April of 20, 2003, and it was not changed at all in 10 years until last month. And a series of changes, very thick and arcane and tedious changes, were mandated by the High Tech Act, by GINA, the Genetic Information Non Discrimination Act, and all sorts of other things, and they combined it all. Here are three important things that changed with regard to research authorizations. First, and I apologize for this being off center, I'm not sure why that happened. Um, but in the past, you could not have under HIPAA what's called a compound authorization. It had to be for... That's an improvement. <laughs> wow. Well, wait a yes, okay. Good. Um, that, that saves you a lot of my voice. You just look, okay. Uh, in, in the past, you couldn't have what's called a compound authorization. An authorization could only authorize you to do one thing. You want to do something else, you had to get a separate one. But now it says an exception is where you get an individual's authorization to use and disclose their PHI in research and then retain the information um, for some sort of biobank. And you can see how important that would be to researchers, so that's one change. Second change is that under the common rule, you could authorize uh, future research by giving some 
some research or your sample or, or your health records for unspecified future research, right? If you couldn't do that, you couldn't have a biobank. But under the HIPAA privacy rule, authorizations had to be study specific. So if you wanted individually identifiable health information, you needed a separate authorization each time you use that. And that was unbelievably burdensome. And the way many researchers got around that was to de-identify the information, even though you strip it of much of its utility by doing it. Well, the omnibus amendments change that. And it provides that authorizations need not be study specific and you can authorize the disclosure of health information for future research uses. So in this way, it harmonizes to a degree the common rule requirement and the privacy rule requirement, which was a major problem in the past. In the commentary to the rule, not the rule itself, it says that maybe a good idea would be if you could give people options about what they what kind of research you're authorizing them. So it, it sort of points you in the direction of tiered authorizations, like we have tiered consents, but it doesn't require it. Okay, and number three is the issue of authorization for future health records. So a researcher wants my specimen, a researcher wants my health records, but it would be very interesting for them to be able to follow me over time and see whether, whether the drugs are giving me are working or whether my condition um, uh, improves or, or worsens in the future. And the privacy rule did not address that in the past. It now clarifies that an authorization can include future health records for an indefinite period of time. And here's where I have some problem with that. Because if today, I go to a doctor and they want to do a biopsy of my throat or something and ask me, can we keep your sample, can we keep your medical records and do research on them? I'll say, sure. And maybe they'll say, and sign also, this signature also authorizes us to get your future health records. And I might say, fine. But suppose a year or two from now, um, I develop some sort of sexually transmitted infection or substance abuse problem or mental health problem or think of any other sort of sensitive information. Even though I have the right to go back and say, okay, no more new stuff, you're never going to do that. And people are going to be unhappy, I think, when their sensitive information is routinely disclosed in perpetuity to a researcher who got an authorization years before. So what I've suggested as a way of balancing the privacy interests of the individual and the research interest is to have these future health record disclosures time limited. And I've proposed that they be every five years. I think shorter than that would be burdensome, but I think if you have it unlimited, it's, it's just too open-ended because people's views on how sensitive their information is changes over time. So now I want to get to the third area, and that is compelled authorizations. What's this mean? If I want to apply for a life insurance policy today, they want to know what health I'm in. And to get the policy, I have to sign an authorization releasing my records to the life insurance company. If I want a disability insurance policy, same thing. Long-term care insurance policy, same thing. If I want to apply for a job, same thing with a couple of uh, asterisks that I'll explain. And there are millions of these so-called compelled authorizations. I don't have to do it, but if I want a job, or if I want to apply for workers' comp benefits, or I want to apply for Social Security disability, I have to sign one of these things. The problem is these people who are requesting my information have an absolutely legitimate and lawful reason for wanting to get some parts of my record. But the essence of electronic health records is that they're not only interoperable, but they're longitudinal and comprehensive. The information never goes away, right? So ideally in the future, your college health records 
are going to be accessible to anybody, right? Um, and if you, on homecoming weekend, showed up and you were a little messed up, there's going to be a code there that says substance abuse, and it's going to follow you forever. And any employer wants to punch in substance abuse, there you pop. They don't care when. They don't care how. So here is, here is um, the estimate that um, we put together about how many compelled authorizations in the United States. And if you read the methodology, it's unbelievably conservative. Right? I think it's many more times this. But just to be safe, um, the largest one, employment entrance exams. So after conditional offer of employment, the employer can require that you sign an authorization of unlimited scope except for genetic information. Um, and uh, over 10 million of those a year. Then comes individual life insurance. You can see the, all these. And the total is over 25 million. These are lawful disclosures of, in most instances, comprehensive information. Even though the statutes in many cases, such as in many workers' comp statutes, they say send information about Joe Smith's fall. Well, he, there, there could be a lot of reasons why Joe Smith falls. Right? He didn't necessarily trip. He may have some, uh, you know, balance disorder. He, who knows what the reason is? Send everything. So, how do you keep these third-party requesters from getting access to sensitive information that they don't need? What options are there to limit this? And I think there are three main options. It's not me. Okay, one is um, you tell people, okay, one is you tell people that they have an opt-in, opt-out opportunity so that you can decline to participate in health information exchange and, but if you do, everything goes to anybody who gets the right of those records. I don't think that's very practical. That defeats the whole purpose of electronic health records. On the other extreme, you grant people line item control. You say, anything that you want in there that you view as sensitive, you can somehow mask, delete, um, segment, or whatever. And I think that's also a terrible idea because physicians wouldn't trust the records that were edited in ways that they have no way of knowing what, how they were even edited. I don't know how many people would do that. When we had held hearings on this issue, um, we heard from many of the other countries that were um, ahead of us in uh, electronic health records. And the head of the Denmark program said, we, get, we let people exclude anything they want. And nobody does it. But they love that they're able to do it. Now, would that be the same in the United States? I have no idea. The middle ground that has gained some degree of traction in the United States is segmentation or sequestration of sensitive information. And what this means is there would be certain pre-identified fields of information that everyone would know what they were, some of these on this list, like domestic violence, mental health, and you could, as a patient, elect to have this information not readily accessible by any person, including your health care providers. Now, it raises all sorts of complications that I don't have time mm -hmm. to get into, like what would clinical decision support track? Would it be just the segmented stuff or both stuff? Okay. Um, and physicians, if they knew this, might be able to ask you for additional consent. So in other words, you can't go to your ob -GYN and have your reproductive health history segmented. That wouldn't be great health care, right? So you'd have to give them an extra code. Or if you were being prescribed powerful uh, painkillers, the um, prescribing doc might want to know if you have any psychiatric meds that might interact and would want additional uh, information. 
The problem arises not in the medical context because I think these obstacles can be overcome. It's in the disclosures to these third parties, all these other people who are compelling you to sign authorization. So I have two examples for you. First one, a man applies to be a bank security guard, involves carrying a gun. The bank wants to check his medical records and he signs a, an authorization, but the man has segmented his mental health and substance abuse records. Should he be able to prevent the bank from obtaining these records? By segmenting it. It may be valuable in a healthcare setting so that when he has a toothache, his dentist doesn't see this sensitive information, but this third party has a legitimate interest. Example number two, a woman applies for a life insurance policy and she signs an authorization. She segmented her reproductive health history, but she has a history of cervical cancer that's not picked up. Does the life insurance company have a right to see this information? And the answer would be, well, of course, how can you have medical underwriting for life insurance if you're segmenting um, some serious health history? So what I'm suggesting to you is that this issue is not a procedural issue. And we're fighting it in procedural terms. These are substantive issues. How are we going to underwrite life insurance or disability insurance? What kinds of information do these third parties legitimately have a need to know? And how, does, how do we balance that against the privacy interests of individuals? So data segmentation, although my preference of the three options, is only the starting point. I think in the examples that I gave you, like the bank security guard, there should be a presumption that segmentation is appropriate, and then the burden would be on the requester, the bank, to sh show why more information is needed. But health privacy is not an abstraction. They go beyond the HIPAA privacy rule, which at the best sets sort of procedural rules. They are substantive, subject-specific, highly contentious. You know, think about you're going to tell the ins life insurance industry how they, how they can do medical underwriting in the future after 300 years of doing it a different way. These issues have been mostly overlooked, and I believe there can be no meaningful health privacy without resolving them. So I thank you for your indulgence with my voice, and uh, later I'll answer your questions. Our third speaker is Suzanne Rivera. Dr. Rivera is the Associate Vice President for Research at Case Western University here. She uh, oversees much of the research enterprise. She's also a professor in our Department of Bioethics in the medical school. Uh, in addition to her university duties, she serves as a member of the uh, Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections, and she is going to tell us about how privacy is overrated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Professor Hoffman, for inviting me to participate in this panel today. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, sorry. Go back. This is my maiden voyage with Prezi, so let me just make sure I can get this moving the right way. Okay. Uh, I just have to begin with the obligatory housekeeping slide about conflicts of interest and such. No? There we go. Okay, I know this is a provocative title. Uh, the claim that privacy is overrated elicits a kind of a clenching response among many people, including those in the world of human research protections, which is the world I usually operate in because a uh, violation of privacy is considered one of the anticipated risks of research. And 
Privacy and autonomy are joined conceptually, so a violation of privacy is seen as a harm to autonomy. Even if it's only a theoretical dignitary harm in the case where your privacy is violated and you don't even know that it's been violated. And the vast majority of people who work in the field of human research protections are oriented to think primarily about potential harms. Uh, so this orientation is understandable because the bioethics subspecialty of applied research ethics was born out of a response to scandalous research violations that resulted in harms to human health, welfare, and dignity, all which were committed in the name of science. These historical imperatives that created our modern research ethics tradition have shaped a profession that defaults toward mistrust of investigators, and a fear of injury or other harms to subjects, and, and that's resulted in an attitude of benevolent paternalism, which is expressed through regulations that unfortunately have not kept paces with advances in science. And that's a theme I think that we've heard from other speakers today. The journalistic investigation by Rebecca Sklute of the circumstances surrounding the creation of the HeLa cell line was a recent high profile example of what can happen to the public's trust in science and in scientists when people feel deceived or violated or exploited. So because research abuses have happened in the past, we have reason to assume they will continue to happen and we tend to approach evaluation of potential research studies through the lens of worry. And this worry is amplified by comorbid fears about new technologies such as electronic health records, but also things like cloud-based digital storage, media, and social networking websites, all of which often are seen by research regulators and privacy advocates as potential instruments of harm, resulting both from inadvertent disclosures, but also deliberate hacking. And I should say here that although these fears of new technology may be generational, they're no less real. We need to address them candidly, I think, because the age cohort of people who are making legal and regulatory decisions about research may feel a little queasy about online avatars giving consent in a second life environment online or real-time real tweets from hospital operating rooms. But increasingly, the age cohort of potential research subjects takes for granted the ubiquitous connectivity that's made possible by these technologies. So with specific regard to secondary uses of EMR data for research, and Nick, you had this image in, your sli in one of your slides too, the emphasis on protection is a matter of some controversy. The previous speakers already provided a great review of why EMR are, data are so valuable for research and public health, including post-marketing surveillance, but concerns have been raised by privacy advocates and human research ethicists uh, about the need to protect individual privacy rights and research because, at least in part, because electronic storage and transmission of large data sets somehow feels less secure to us than the metal filing cabinets and bicycle couriers of yore. And what I mean by that is if we thought our data were really secure when people were passing around manila folders full of our data or sending them across town on the back of a bicycle, I think that that was, um, Naive. So I would argue that our electronic measures for EMR security now actually provide greater protection and audit trails than paper folders used to when we use those to contain medical records. But, you know, like the person who puts their life at greater risk every day getting behind the wheel of a car and then despairs at the thought of an annual airplane flight, I think the problem is really that we fear that with which we're less familiar. And even if the material harms of a privacy breach never did come to fruition, reasonable people have concerns that big government or big pharma might see something about us that we would prefer to keep private. We place a great deal of importance on privacy in this country, not only because it's a constitutional right, but also because it traditionally has been an aspect of human dignity that we value. And because privacy is linked closely with autonomy, one of the three foundational principles of modern research ethics, violations of privacy are thought to be synonymous or at least morally equivalent with violations of personal autonomy. 
So when I say privacy is overrated, I don't mean it's not important. What I mean in the context of today's meeting is that our focus on privacy has become a hindrance to scientific progress, which we can't really uh, justify on ethical grounds. I think we fuss about it disproportionately. And it's not the only value to be considered when determining whether and how to use EMR for research. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to focus on the following four points. First, that for historical reasons, we tend to treat research differently than the other activities of life. You heard the word exceptionalism already today. This is a kind of research exceptionalism. That is to say, we're more protective in research than outside of research. Second, that attitudes about privacy outside of research are evolving in the sense that the boundaries between what's public and what's private are becoming more fluid. Third, because treating research differently, I would argue, is harmful to public health, and since attitudes about privacy outside of research are changing, I think we should reconsider our attitudes about privacy in research. And then finally, that the value of existing data, whether de-identified or used in an identifiable form with IRB permission and all the applicable requirements to preserve confidentiality should be maximized for the common good. So with regard to research exceptionalism, you know, I, I don't need to review the shameful history of research abuses in the US and elsewhere. I think it suffices to say that for valid historical reasons, we have developed a kind of way of thinking about research that's different than the rest of our lives. And probably you recognize these pictures as uh, a photo from the Nuremberg trials, a photo from the Tuskegee syphilis study, and a photo from the Stanford prison experiment, which are just sort of three punctuation marks of research ethics abuses uh, in the US. Well, not in the US, in the world. Um, so in research, we require voluminous informed consent documents before volunteers can participate in studies for good reasons, but we also require compelling justifications from uh, researchers when they want to collect information that could be potentially stigmatizing to subjects, and we consider genetic information especially sensitive. But outside of a research context, we share information about ourselves all the time. Some examples are as innocuous as answering a phone survey about political candidates or TV viewing history, but this slide here shows a piece of so-called genetic art, the likes of which you could purchase from a company called DNA DX, which will take a genetic sample from you and use it to create a print you could hang on your living room wall. Leaving home decorating aside, we derive many benefits from sharing our information and allowing our information to be used by other people. Consider the example of a company's transaction database, which makes it possible for a customer service representative to instantaneously access your account history, allowing a personalized encounter to resolve your problem. And targeted advertising, as you've already heard, is another example of ways your information is used to make your life easier. By tracking users, browsing, and purchase histories, companies like Amazon and Netflix can tailor suggestions for new purchases <clears throat> based upon a customer's previous selections, or in this case, her friend's favorites. Now, what they're doing with your data behind the scenes looks and smells a lot like privacy invading research. But for most people, the trade-off seems like a good deal. They learn about your soft spot for Clint Eastwood movies or whatever in exchange for everyone having a better movie selection experience. Uh, I, I would argue that the very definition of privacy is evolving. So to put this in perspective, here's what very smart people, legal rock stars, thought about privacy in 1890, that by putting still photos in newspapers, the end of the world was coming. And I, you know, I think when you, when you historicize this problem, what you can see is that our thoughts about privacy have changed. And what that means is that Privacy is more of an attitude than some kind of immutable object, and it's contextual. So, you know, the advent of the internet provides us with another example. Uh, its veneer of quasi-privacy has created new avenues for broad electronic self-disclosure, such as listservs and chat rooms and blogs. People post their sonograms on Facebook. They tweet about their colonoscopies. They upload their entire medical histories to share sites like Patients Like Me. 
And numerous electronic applications are available for free or at a price. Many of you probably have them on your smartphones or your iPads that can deliver services and entertainment to you in exchange for your information. So for example, you could have real time traffic jams tweeted to your cell phone, but to get this service, your location has to be tracked by the provider. And the permission to allow that kind of location surveillance, which in other contexts might seem like an invasion of your privacy, is given willingly in exchange for the perceived benefit you get. All this voluntary self-disclosure about personal information, including health information like a sonogram, suggests that perceptions are changing about the nature of privacy itself. And these changes, I would argue, should cause us to question whether our fears about research uses of data are antiquated or irrational. However, these changing societal attitudes are not, do not appear to be informing our thoughts about appropriate protections from so-called informational risks in research. Since people disclose information about themselves outside of the research environment in ways that can be shared, copied, reused, even reused for commercial purposes for which you get no cut of the profits, uh, I, I would like to ask the question whether we should be considering whether it makes sense that we continue to treat data used in research so differently from information disclosed in other fora. And as an example here, I would say uh, many of you know that the DHHS recently took a stab at updating the common rule, the regs that govern the use of human research subjects. And they did so in large part with an eye toward addressing privacy issues. But unfortunately, I think the changes proposed via the ANPRM that came out in July of 2011 actually took us in the wrong direction because if they were adopted, they would establish mandatory standards for data security and information protection whenever research data are collected, generated, stored, or used, and additional rules protecting against the use of de-identified information that is collected or generated as part of a research study. So this is making it hard, more difficult. Specifically, it proposes general written consent for research use of biospecimens, even those that have been stripped of identifiers, written consent for study of existing data documents, records, or specimens to include all secondary research use of identifiable data and specimens if they've been collected for purposes other than the currently proposed research, and, and most perplexing to me, a prohibition against the unconsented reuse of existing de-identified data if they were originally collected for research purposes. So if they were originally collected for non-research purposes and they're de-identified, it would still be okay to use them without consent. But if they were originally collected for a research purpose and de-identified, you would have to get consent to reuse them under the current proposal. And, you know, um, hearkening back to the earlier, one of the earlier panelists, this would be in direct conflict with the idea of respect for context, because if you already gave the data in a research setting, one might be able to infer that you're more likely to be okay with it being used for a non, uh, another research project. So back to the question of autonomy. I, I think the people who wrote the ANPRM were well-intentioned, but they're very concerned about autonomy. They're, they're so concerned that they're treating it like it's the most important of the three principles that are considered foundational for ethical human research. But my suggestion is that privileging autonomy over the principles of justice and beneficence is out, an outdated way of thinking about research and can actually be harmful. Disqualifying the use of de-identified data or specimens unless subjects are reconsented is First of all, it's illogical. I mean, it's kind of a weird metaphysical problem because how can you obtain consent from people when you don't know their identities? You'd have to re-identify the data somehow to go and get consent. But also, if you disqualify the use of all those existing data, that means you're requiring more data to be collected from more people than is necessary to actually answer the research questions. You're exposing more people to risk that way. And that's that's both inefficient from a justice perspective. It means, you know, with regard to the distribution of resources, you're wasting resources when data already exists that you could be using to answer that question. But also, it unnecessarily exposes more people to the risk of harm, which is a violation of the beneficence principle. So I'm saying this is a case of overemphasizing individual rights at the expense of group well-being. 
Um, this notion of information altruism, I think, is a good one. I'm crediting uh, Cohen's paper from 2005 with coining the term, although others um, also have used it. Um, but basically what I'm arguing is that EMR data, because they can be used to answer important questions, we ought to be trying to foster more of a sense or a value for information altruism. And um, what that would mean with regard to the ANPRM is that rather than adding new roadblocks to important research that could improve the human condition, we should, as has been argued by several of my colleagues today, uh, instead think about EMR data as a community asset to be used for the common good. And this would require a shift away from regulations designed to protect us from evildoers and toward something different, a promotion with responsible stewardship of an ethos that values information sharing instead. So uh, the word balancing was in the title of this meeting, and I think it's a really helpful way to illustrate the tension between individual liberties expressed through an emphasis on privacy protection and group benefits expressed with the term progress in the title of this uh, conference. When we concern ourselves primarily with protection of privacy rights, we're focusing on the individual and the likelihood and magnitude of at least two kinds of potential harms. Material harms, which you know, in the context of EMR data could theoretically affect someone's employability, or their insurability, potentially even their legal status in the country, or their ability to marry, depending on what it is that you would choose to limit based on what you found out about the person. But also more abstract kinds of harms, uh, like the dignitary harm that comes from an infringement of autonomy when data are used, even if the subject is unaware of it, some people would say that that's still a harm to their dignity and also the emotional harm that could come from a discovery about which people wish they didn't know. So, you know, for example, if a particular group of people were found to be uh, associated with a dangerous or stigmatizing health condition, potentially that information could injure the status of the group and harm the individual's morale as a member of that group. But um, on the other side of the scale, which I'm calling the side that's, that, that weighs more, um, for me it weighs more, is scientific progress. And you know, as I've tried to show, I find the importance of potential benefit here very compelling. Benefit to individuals who can receive better health care and benefit to the larger community of people who can enjoy not only better health, but potentially more efficient uses of labor, money, and other resources. And I want to underscore here that I'm not making a utilitarian claim when I say this, because I'm not. I'm, Although somebody could say on consequentialist grounds that an invasion of privacy over here, violating the autonomy of one person, if it helps many people over here, um, would be justifiable. But that's, that approach would miss an important aspect of my argument. What I'm saying is that we each benefit when we all participate in information sharing. This is a more communitarian approach. And because I think it is consistent with the three fundamental ethical principles of human research protection, I want to touch on each one really briefly and explain why I think that's the case. Wrapping up. With regard to respect for persons or autonomy, I think our paternalistic impulse to protect actually reduces liberty in the sense that IRBs and others reject protocols out of privacy fears when the individuals affected may very well have been willing to participate or to allow their data to be used without their knowledge or consent. And with respect to beneficence, I think failure to use existing data is an opportunity cost. So limiting progress actually reduces beneficence. And finally, since the principle of justice in research means equitable distribution of risks and benefits, I think the situation we have now is unfair because everyone benefits from discoveries made by using data from relatively few people. So you know, a, an ethos of information sharing for the common good would be more just. Everyone would participate and everyone would benefit. So why do I think privacy is overrated? Because we already share all sorts of information outside the research context. Sharing EMR information would benefit everyone through new scientific discoveries. And I think when we let fear shape science policy, we sometimes do more harm than good. Thank you. Yeah, the panelists could come down for questions. <clears throat>
Thank you. So I have a comment and a question. I think mostly uh, uh, directed at Mark, but um, I was on one of the secretary's committees to try to design the rules for HIPAA back in the ni late 90s, and and I was I advocated for the Danish model um, that patients should have absolute control over the information in their medical records. Obviously, I didn't carry the day, and I was. Uh, shot down uh, by two arguments. One was that, well, but that would limit the ability of these records to be available to help patients, you know, uh, uh, health-wise. And I said that's the patient's decision. And more, uh, the one that really seemed to matter was, and that would limit the ability of records to be used in medical malpractice litigation. Um, and I said, well, uh, because patients could always strip out, you know, un, un, and I said, well, providers already have that ability. They can simply fail to enter, you know, something that would be, uh, you know, uh, liability uh, creating. Uh, but nevertheless, that didn't um, carry the day. But that does lead me to, uh, oh, and I said, by the way, you know, if a patient had redacted their record, there would be a little note saying this is a redacted record. That leads me to the question, in terms of segmentation, um, you know, if you ask the FBI if you have a record, you have a record, because they create one because you right. ask them. Um, wouldn't that, wouldn't, so if, if a, you know, somebody stripped out the substance abuse, wouldn't an employer see that, and that's the end of that job applicant? Well, it's a good question, and that issue was um, debated, and there, here are the options, right? You don't say anything, if somebody's segmented part of it. Or you say medical, uh, mental health information redacted, or you say a portion of the record redacted. And um, it seems to me that if you put that um, somebody redacted their mental health information, I mean, you might as well give it to them, right? So that's... Um, that's really not attractive, but there are all these separate issues that we need to consider. Another issue is um, should there be a break the glass feature in the case of an emergency? Again, they get to, to segmented information, um, et cetera. So uh, it's quite complicated when you get into the weeds, but I, I think it's the most attractive of our options. I think the, uh, the, 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 uh, the shift you make from process to substance should be underlined as well. I think that's a, an incredible insight um, that what we really would be doing is we wouldn't be regulating privacy here. We would be regulating the insurance industry. We would be saying we're going to move from experiential to community rating, um, which, let's face it, is sort of consistent with the Affordable Care Act. And, and some other things as well. But, so I think that's a... a, a but, but it all depends on the context. Here's, here's a debate that's going to happen over the next year, two, or five years for sure. And that is, if you're a long-term care insurer, what you don't want in your patient mix are people who are going to get Alzheimer's. Because the cost per patient is substantially higher. Should a long-term care insurer be able to get genetic information about your genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's or even require that you be tested for certain alleles? And the answer is it's not a privacy issue, as I tried to mention. It's how should we spread the risk of this condition? Is it for all ratepayers? which would be up, um, if, you, if you say to insurance companies that they can do this, one effect is going to be that people who are predisposed to Alzheimer's, even if they want to buy it, can't, and they're going to be pushed into the Medicaid population, right? And we're going to pay for them as taxpayers as opposed to long-term care insurance policy payers. It's how we're going to spread this, in, and it's very complicated in each sort of little segment. We'll go back and forth. I guess I want to make a comment about the concept of privacy and autonomy and whether our privacy 
uh, concept conceptualization of privacy is actually changing. And I, I hear this a lot in the idea that the younger generation doesn't care about privacy because we post things on Facebook and on Twitter. And I personally take issue with that because I feel that it's just simply more public now. And it's easier to study and it's easier to see. But just because you know, someone might post their sonogram on Facebook doesn't mean they might not have been apt to post it in their cubicle at work before Facebook existed, and that it wasn't something that they would have shared publicly previously. It's just now people, more people can see it, and it is information that can now be aggregated in a way that was never able to be aggregated before. So I don't necessarily see that social media has changed how we conceptualize privacy, because I personally believe that just because I decided to share a certain segment of my health information on social media doesn't mean that there aren't other areas of my health information that I want to keep private. And just because you know there are new ways for that to be, you know, you know, aggregated and mined, data mined, and things like that. I, I think you and I actually agree because I'm not saying that younger people don't value privacy. What I'm saying is that the boundaries between what is kept private and what is in the public sphere, it's a moving goalpost. And that doesn't mean privacy is not important and it doesn't mean younger people don't care about it. But I, I also share with you your concern that just because the medium of sharing is a new medium, we shouldn't be overly freaked out about it. I think things are evolving and to pretend that they're static and that they don't move and that we all agree across cultural and generally racial lines about what should be available on the internet and what should be kept at home is a mistake. Well, I guess, so just, I feel that, that there's just not enough information to know that there actually has been a real shift in conceptualizations of w what should remain private and what should. Well, I mean, I didn't go into it here, but actually there's tons of empirical data that show across age cohorts that conceptions about what should be kept private and what can be shareable demonstrably are changing. But the reason I'm really careful to follow that up with, but I don't think that means privacy doesn't matter, is I think that even people who use social media a lot and post things like tweeting from the operating room or putting their sonograms up, I think that they would say, there are things I keep private and I don't post. So it's not that the whole idea of privacy has gone away, it's just the notion of what you're willing to share into cyberspace and what you would prefer to keep within your home is something that's different. I think it also might be good to think about what you think might be a good thing to share when you're 20. You, your ideas of privacy will change throughout your life as well. Yep, agreed. May I um, respond briefly? One of the things that I'd like to get out um, is to challenge the notion that the conflict between privacy and autonomy on the one hand and public uses for research or other things on the other is a conflict between the individual's interest and the group's interest. I don't, I think that's a false way of setting the problem. I'm gonna take a taxi or a limo or something back to the airport in a few hours. I don't want my driver to forego getting treatment for TB because he or she is afraid that that's going to follow him or her for the rest of their life. I don't want my airline pilot to forego mental health care because he or she is afraid that they're never going to be able to work in the airline industry. We all have a public interest in individuals participating in prompt, timely, effective health care. And there are numerous studies that show that individuals who are concerned about their health information will engage in defensive practices, including not telling their physicians uh, important information, foregoing treatment, seeking treatment in underground sources, and so forth. We need privacy to help other interests besides sort of narrow dignitary or economic interests the way sometimes they're painted. I think another aspect of that false dichotomy is that the public good, as, as described, is a secondary good. The, the primary good that's being defended are researchers and the rent-seeking behavior that they may have 
uh, with regard to research funds and so on. So I think the, 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 that, that public good uh, is, is, is secondary uh, sometimes in our discussions uh, with regard to, to those issues. But I would, I would add that I think the individual does benefit through scientific progress. So it's not, it's, not a, it's not a matter of saying I'm either an altruist to help other people or I'm selfish and I keep my information to myself. I and mean, the point I'm trying to make is I think that by participating, we do help our own self-interest also. Okay, I don't think, I, I think we're, I, for me, the question is uh, the choice architecture mm -hmm. uh, and, and how we set that up. Not, not, not false or, yeah, I hear or somewhat uh, odd dichotomies. Yeah. So Nick and Suzanne, you gave, um, presentations that really built on each other incredibly well. It was almost like you must have planned it because it's very effective. And mm. in the end, I was very convinced that HIPAA is a small little component of our life of privacy that's no longer reflective of what we're thinking about in the bigger picture, especially due to big data. And Suzanne, your idea of thinking of this as a natural resource is just perfect. Mm. So what I want to think about then is what's the next step if we agree with what you're saying. What would we protect? And how would we protect it? And the reason I'm asking this is when Sharona started out today, she showed us the Akron General Hospital ad. And I think Elizabeth Troy's name was there with some of her health data and the prescriptions. Mm. And I, I was a little shocked by that. And so what is it that we would do going forward to acknowledge that the 1960s and prior to that didn't quite have it right? And we've moved to a regime in 2013 that suggests we don't have it right either. Well, for me, uh, and I, uh, probably from uh, stressing those, uh, those three pieces from the White House uh, report, um, I think the, a shift in how we view data autonomy um, is important and to move away from sort of all or nothing. Uh, and instead regulate on uh, much more by uh, reference to context. Um, I think that is where you get closer to the expectations of the persons who are giving their information. If I give my information for the purposes of a commercial transaction, uh, why should that information find itself in essentially a surrogate big data medical record about me? Um, I didn't give the information for that. I think we have to have a, a much better sense amongst data uh, custodians that that data maybe isn't forever, uh, that it should, that the collection uh, should be time limited in some way. So those are the, the conversations. Now, admittedly, they, they may not find the middle for you because they tend to be at the regulatory uh, end of things um, and therefore would be resisted hard by um, I think primarily commercial interests, but I think bona fide researchers will will worry about a spillover from that kind of regulation into their world, even if I didn't intend that, and we might see resistance there as well. Uh, perhaps. I mean, I, what I would add is that um, I think the current system we have is actually not so bad. Um, in that we don't think that these decisions about what should be permitted are kind of like binary choices that even a computer could figure out. Because if they were, we would just, we wouldn't have IRBs. We'd have a Scantron form that you'd fill out and you'd feed it in and you'd, you know, you'd get a green light. And the reason we don't do that is because we have this sense that human beings need to sit around a table and really think about the implications of a study and the, the justification for the use of the data and whether the privacy protection scheme looks appropriate for the level of sensitivity of the data. I think that that's actually okay, but I think we have a couple problems in our current system. One is that it only applies to institutions that receive federal funds to do research, so there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on that's completely unregulated. And I, I think that's a problem. And Ted Kennedy, before he died, I think for 10 or 12 years, tried to introduce legislation to say, if these ethical principles are so important, why don't we apply them to all human research that's done in any context? And the second thing that, that worries me is that this proposal to change the common rule to make it so that even de-identified data would require consent. I think, as I said, not only do I think it's sort of nonsensical in a practical way, but I also think that the 
we have already an idea that if something's been de if data have been de-identified, that theoretically there is no human subject at that point. What you have are you know numbers or letters on a page, and that letters on a page are not the same as a person. And if we start treating letters or numbers on a page as if it were a person and entitled to all of the dignity that a person is entitled to, I think we confuse really important issues and we impede progress. So I would say one thing we could do is not adopt the current proposal, which is to start treating even de-identified data as if they are people. Because very important, as we've heard from three or four other people today, very important scientific questions can get answered about you know hypertension in kiddos, for example, when you aggregate large amounts of data without ever needing to know who the individual people are and without ever having to put them at risk of having that information be associated with their person. May I uh, try to answer that? Um, if you view the harm as a privacy harm, then it's easy to come to the conclusion that de-identified, no privacy harm, no harm. That's not how people actually view that. Mm. They view it as an autonomy harm. These are records that belong to them. These are tissues that belong to them. They want to have a say in what happens to them. If you ask them for consent, and have a good reason like research, they will give it to you. If you use it without asking them, they are very unhappy. It's not about privacy. It's about respect, dignity, control. And in certain populations, their cultural image of the body and their control over their bodies is even higher. And so if you take the position that people don't care about privacy as much, that's inconsistent then with the view that, well, we ought to just go ahead and use it, de-identify it. It must be the case then that what we ought to work to is ways of more simply, efficiently getting the consent that people will give to us, right? We get consent for all the software stuff, Nobody even reads it. I'm not suggesting that. But there's a whole range between a 30-page consent document and click-through consent on stuff. If you ask people to consent, they'll give it to you. I also think that people are more likely to give consent um, if they feel they have a stake in, in, in what's coming in the future. Um, and I mean, I think this, this circles back to some of Mark Rodwin's uh, uh, paper earlier. I mean, if, if someone knows that the data is going to be protected, say, by sort of a market inalienability rule um, that cannot just be sort of sold off to, mm -hmm. to, to another data broker, or if there are some uh, rules with regard to uh, the public uh, nature of the discovery mm -hmm. uh, that that data uh, leads to. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're going to see people's choices uh, and maybe also their acceptance of more pro-research choice architectures mm -hmm. uh, change uh, over time. Um, so that, that I think is, is something to look at. I, I think the, um, the NIH is, um, um, uh, uh, and I, the, the new NIH rule with regard to you have to publish, uh, you have to... to, to uh, uh, Your results. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's beginning to go. Um, <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, and we're seeing uh, that sort of uh, racked up uh, to the sort of nth degree uh, increasingly in Europe mm -hmm. um, uh, with regard to publicly funded research and, and, and that mm -hmm. sort of disclosure. That, that may well change the narrative mm -hmm. um, or assist in, in, in the narrative. Um, hi, my name is Tiffany Brunson. I'm from the CDC. Um, and I've really uh, enjoyed this discussion, particularly because of the, um, the colorful nature <laughs> um, of the folks involved here. But I think one of the biggest questions I have is, what do you think the challenge is for federal agencies, larger federal agencies, to engage this um, in terms of public health surveillance? Well, public health. And, and, and challenges procedurally and both legally. Well, first of all, unplug the cable that ties your department to Homeland Security. <laughs> mm. Mm. 
as I mentioned briefly, public health is one of these areas where you don't need consent or authorization for a covered entity to send the information for a public health purpose. <coughs> but the privacy rule do doesn't establish it. Can you start? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry. Any duties to do so. That duty is based on something else, right? Federal law, state law, et cetera. It only gives them the freedom from the privacy rule. The key, I think, for CDC and other places is what kind of information they're going to request and what uses they're going to make of it. And so in Haines had problems over the years with suspicions that they're getting too much information or using it uh, wrongly, and, uh, and I don't think those criticisms were valid, but a lot of it, it's, it's public perceptions, and I, so I think that's very important. And I, I would add to that that I think another big challenge is that the agencies themselves haven't harmonized their rules around any of this stuff. I mean, I go sit in these commission meetings and there's a representative from the CDC and another one from the FDA and another one from the Office of Civil Rights and another one from the Department of Energy. And we're all sitting around, you know, like this. And each agency has taken a slightly different approach with slightly different definitions of what a person is and what data are and what privacy means. And it makes it extremely difficult for us to have a kind of a consistent, unified philosophical approach when the agencies themselves can't even agree on definitions of things that should be relatively straightforward. So for uh, where the rubber hits the road at the university where we get grants from all the different agencies makes it really hard for us to figure out how, how we even know what is the right thing to do. So we're sitting around a table discussing a study and we have to ask ourselves not only what feels right, but also, oh, and which agency is funding this one? Because we probably have to review all of the subparts that apply from that agency and see whether they're in conflict with some other rule that we're trying to apply. So I think the when you ask what the what are the challenges, I think one of the big ones is that the agencies themselves don't agree on some of the fundamental core principles.